a continuous in explaining the concepts, precepts, and commandments of God. He wanted to add some more on to the original number one that you had. And uh, you still can hang, please still hang on that number three because all of it comes together. But some of the things we must continue to talk about. And again, this week we want to start off with the Gospel of Matthews 4.4. 4. And uh, we say this over and over again because you're going to have to hear it by faith over and over again before you can really get learn it. We say we learn it, but then we go outside and do the opposite. Hallelujah. The word of God says, but he answered and said, it is written in the Bible, long before you asked me this question, God has already told man, that's what he's saying. That man shall not live by bread alone. But, and he's very specific, and he's specific in a way that we should pick up, <coughs> but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, you must live on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now you got a natural life, and that's born dead and staying dead. And then you got a spiritual life that's been born again and staying forever. And you have to be careful in the difference. And we have to go back and get the basics. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. How many people know that in here? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Not in this earth, not in the kingdom to come. So we have no way in the natural without the word ever to be born, saved, and live for eternity. Is that not what Jesus just said? And we have to understand that. And a lot of the things that we do understand and, and don't understand, we won't, don't carry it too far. And next I want you to look at Matthews 8, 8, since we talked about uh, the number one thing that keeps man away from God is because God says either you're going to serve him or you're going to serve money. Say that after me. Jesus says man will serve mammoth or money. Either you are going to serve things or you're going to serve God. That's all he said. Either you're going to be sold out to things which are perishable or you're going to be sold out to God which is eternal and not perishable. And when we think about this, the Centurion in Matthews 8 8 when he responded to Jesus we have seen it one way but why don't you see it the spiritual way just as well and this man a centurion who had not been anointed as a Jew there was no Jew in him and he was not a proselyte. He was a soldier, a centurion. And his worker was sick and dying. And in Matthew 8, 8, 8, let's go back to 7, when Jesus says to him, I will come and heal him. 
His servant was so sick as a hound dog. Amen. But in eight, look what Jesus says. But the centurion, not going to church, not holy, not being baptized, not doing all the things that we all do, but the centurion says, Lord, I'm a sinner. I am not worthy for you, God, to come under my roof. He just lowered himself all the way down, even though he held a high position in society, but he knew who he was, dust. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Now, we want to dance all the way around that, but there's no dance in there. This is what moves God, your faith and commitment. That's all he had. That's all he needed. The faith and commitment to go to God and say, you can do anything. You don't have to come to my house. I know you and I love you enough and I serve you enough, even though I'm not a Roman. I mean, I'm not a Jew. Even though I'm not covered in your covenant, God, you're so good and you're so great. All you have to do is just say the word. And Jesus just marveled because it's heathen. Knew more about the word than the so-called religious ones. He says, for I am a man under authority. I, I'm told what to do and I do it. And how many of us are men and women under authority? We're going to question the boss and everybody else. I'm the man under authority. And soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another one, come, and he comes, and, he, and, 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 to, my, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled and says to those who were following him, all the Jews, truly, I say to you, I have never found such great, he didn't say just faith, and look what he said. Such what? Great faith. Come on, y'all. With what? Come on, what's the next word? I have sound for straight. With what? With who? Anyone. Jew, Greek, proselyte, not even none. One man, a woman, a child. Have I found somebody who know God like he does? And I ask you to check yourself. How much do you trust God? If God said it, we say seller, but we don't believe it because time we say that, we go do something opposite. Pastor Lucille spent a whole sermon on Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. God says, I do this for you. I do that for you. I do this for you. I, I bless you. I do this. I multiply you. I do that. I do, 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 do. My job is just doing for you. If you would only listen to my commandments and obey and do the will of God. And we don't obey one minute. We think we need to go out and earn a job and earn our way to living. And never change and then wonder why we're not successful. Because we did not do it God's way. Think about it. You know what you've done over the years. Think about what you, you didn't understand in the scripture because of the concepts of what you thought God was saying. God says what he means. 
he doesn't mean what we think. But he says what he means. And God said what he meant right there. And we have to realize if God said it, I know that he's going to follow through on it. He doesn't have to come to my, come by here, Lord. He doesn't have to come by here. <laughs> yeah, he's already where you are. Well, let's go get the pastor prayer agreement. You don't need no prayer agreement. You just believe God said he did it. Remind him. He said, let you and I sit down and talk together. And let's move on to Luke 8, 11. I want We want to move on a little bit. Luke, Gospel of Luke. But the centurion says, no, 8, 11. Now, the parable of this seed is the word of God. Now, here's Jesus out of his own mouth talking about the concepts, the parable. What I'm going to tell you about this seed is about the word of God. This is the way the word works. And this is how the word multiplies. And this is how the word makes things and bring peace into your life. He says, those beside the road, the soul souls the word, those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and take away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. I want you to just spend some time with me here. Spend some time with the Holy Ghost here. Now look what Jesus just says. The first sowing. And the people that heard about Jesus, he went to the cross for me. He died for me. And he says, if I ask for anything in his name, he'll do it. And right now, I need to get somebody to help me to pay my light bill. No, my light bill is going to be turned off. My light's going to be turned off. And I wonder how many of them pray. I ask Jesus to pay the light bill. They begin to get on the phone call in churches. My light bill's down. They get on the phone call DSS. They call the kids, they call the uncles, they call whoever they can because their light bill's going down. Some of them call their girlfriends and boyfriends and promise them to come over and have a good time as long as you pay for the light bill. Some of them move up and shack up just to get the light bill paid. And the devil has already stole any kind of faith they might have had. Seeking your find. Ask that you shall receive. And we don't, see, now we just proclaim that we were Christians. We proclaim we heard the word of God. And the devil know your soul ain't worth a light bill. He comes in. And he cuts, he get, get, calls you to go look for light bills. You don't come to church, come a light chain on. He's already stole the word. And we just accept it. Don't go to church. We miss 20 or 30 years of our life out there playing that game with the devil. And never can receive anything from God. But the wealth of the sinner has already been stacked up and stacked up and stacked up and stacked up for the jest. But ain't no just to go get it. I'm going to turn around. Why does the wealth of the sinner get stacked up? Why did God send the wealth here? To give it to the devil? He sent the wealth here to give it to you. 
and the meat. But it gets stacked up. Because we can't believe God. We're looking at the way the Baptists do it, the Methodists do it, the Presbyterians do it, and we won't let God talk to us our own self. We won't, we won't spend time with the Holy Ghost. We don't sit down or get up in the middle of the night and say, Holy Ghost, please tell me how to live. And the word of God says the Holy Spirit will not speak except for only what he hears. If you don't act for help, the Holy Ghost ain't going to give you nothing. If you don't ask for his guidance, God has already told you he's not going to tell you anything. You, just like you have to ask Jesus for help, you have to ask God for help. You and I have to ask the Holy Ghost for help. And I'm asking you, how many times a day do you ask the Holy Ghost for help? And when the Holy Ghost comes around, he brings another helper called the Spirit of Wisdom. And she's the one that carries the wealth and long life in her hand. But most of us don't even know who she is. And we don't want to come to church and learn that. We want me to pat you on the back and tell you how great you are for God. I can't do that. I don't know how great you are for God. They tried to pat Jesus on the back. Jesus said, why y'all call me good? Didn't he? We learned anything today. And so the second one, he says, in 14, he says, the seed which fell among the thrones, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go on the way, they are choked with what? Worries, riches, and the pressures of life. And they bring what? No fruit to maturity. Nothing that God has set up to bless their life will ever come to them. That's where most of us go to church every Sunday religiously and don't implement the word because we don't believe it. We're going here and here and here and here, but you can't find my life. You, and, and you can check your own life. And you don't have to go look and see how much money you got in the bank. You have to look and see how happy you are. You have to look and see that all your needs are met. You have to look and see that you are happy whether you got one dress or two pair of shoes. You got to be happy when you are eating and a roof over your head and you can holler praise God. You got to be happy enough to ride in your car because you got gasoline and give praise and thanksgiving to God. You got to be happy about just what God has given you. Forget about the world. But we say, oh, that sinner over there, which God say is an abomination to him. That sinner over there, they don't even go to church and they ride in a better car than me. They're living in a better house than me. Their children are doing better than mine. God said, don't you dare say it. It's an abomination to it. That's all in the Bible. We say it anyway. Because it's not true. There is not one truth. You are walking by sight, not by faith. There's nobody, nobody any wealthier than anybody who got all the food they need, all the clothes they can put on their back and shelter. What else can you add to yourself? What else can you add to your life? And why can uh, we get twisted with dead lies by the devil to tell us that they got something you wish you had? Don't do that. Turn around from that way of thinking. Unless you're faithful over little God will never promote you to a lot. Are we reading the same Bible?
And here are the next seed. But the seed that's in good soil is whether you're a good soil or not. Well, I'm not made out of soil. Yes, you are. You're dirt. You're like all of us. But the seed that is in good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart. Now notice what kind of heart you have to have to hear the word. Honest and good heart. So if you know that somebody is dishonest and they ain't got a good heart and they say they're Christian, you know they're lying. I'm reading you the Bible. How are you supposed to live? By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And Jesus made the statement. If they're not honest and they don't have a good heart, then you know they're lying. He says these that have received in an honest and good heart, and notice what the next thing, hold fast, no matter if they go bankrupt, they're not going to give up Jesus. If the car payment is behind, they're not going to take God's money and use it. If the child gets sick or somebody gets sick, they're not going to take God's money and use it. If the doctors say there's no hope, they're not going to go around and tell anybody there is no hope. They're going to say God heals them. You got to hold fast to everything opposite because the, God says the world knowledge is foolish. But he take the foolishness of the world and confound the wise. And Jesus told, God told the centurion, I'm going to come to your house and heal him. And the centurion said, hey, God, I don't need that. You're a healer. You're God. Just speak it. I know who you are. And we look at it and we can't grasp it because we have been educated by the devil not to believe the Bible. We are being destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Why would God scream, my people, my people, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge? And because you won't change your mind, I will forget your sons. The curse of lack and poverty will pass on to the second generation and the third generation. I did it! Because I believe what the preacher was saying instead of what God told me and the Holy Ghost told me while I was studying the word. And because nobody else agree with me. If mankind must agree with you before you believe it, you just go ahead and you prepare yourself for hell. Ain't no sense in you living right. Just go on. If you're going to live by rules of mankind, you prepare yourself to go to hell. Because that's exactly where you're going. I think in prayer, now I'm praying about that clerk that would not give those licenses to the homosexual couples. Yes, yeah, the law of the land, but God's word supersedes the law of the land. And she will not give up her right of faith to keep her job. And she goes to jail and leave her family outside the jail. How many of us? I'm going to ask you. How many of us will go to jail standing up for Jesus? Hallelujah. God's not going to let us stay there. Because he's the judge is fighting Jesus.
And so in Matthew 20 or 26, but I tell you, now watch you, this is really the really kicker. We're gonna move into another state and we're talking about changing. I tell you, look at it in your Bible, or you can look at it on your paper, Matthew 12, 36. And this is from God's word. Isn't it out of God, a mouth of God? Isn't it, out, isn't it what Jesus says? And we just look over and don't pay any attention to it. We don't understand that every word that Jesus speaks is living and it performs. Every word that Jesus speaks is like he's sending out another automobile. And it's going to do what it's supposed to do. It's like sending out another billion dollars and it's going to do what it's going to do. He's sending out another hospital to heal. It's going to do what it's going to do. And we have to believe that God's words are active and powerful. Sharper than two-edged sword. And they will perform. And they will not return void. He says to you, I tell you, believer, that every callous word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the judgment day. And they say, well, that ain't going to happen in the judgment. No. The judgment day is when you come up to that situation and the devil faces you with it. You're going to have to overcome that word that came out of your mouth, repent of it, and blast him down. Or he's going to rule your life. Hey, bro, Jake, you got a quarter? No, I ain't got a dime. <laughs> hey, bro, John, will you help the church out and donate $100? No, nah, man, I got to pay my light bill. Judgment Day going to come back when your light bill is ready to be turned off. You're going to want to come to church and get $100 to pay your light bill. See, we, God made you and I in his exact likeness. Say that to me, please. God has made me in his exact likeness. And he's given me the same power that he gave Jesus Christ. My words are as powerful as Jesus' word. Jesus said in his last statements to me, in the book of John, that they kept my word and they will keep your word also. And we think that we're just people. No, you're not. See, that's the reason why we get lost for lack of knowledge. We think we can go around and say what the devil say. No. That's why the devil ain't in heaven. That's the reason why God kicked him out of the God. Because he said things that he had to come back to him. Because every word you put out of your mouth, come back to you. So make sure what you say is Bible. He says, and he's warned us every callous word, you go, and you're going to do it in the day of judgment. And then 37 says, but by your words, are you, are you looking at it? That's Psalm, I mean Proverbs. No, that's 37 Matthews. By your words, you will be justified. You're going to get it. Or by your words, you ain't going to get it. By your words, you will get a new house. Or by your words, you're going to become homeless. By your words, you're going to become successful. Because my God supply all my needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. I'm always the head, not the tail. 
I'm above only and never beneath. I am a lender and not a borrower. I pay cash for what I get. I owe no man nothing but to love me. The devil has nothing in me. And I, you know, Pastor Lucy and I was talking, and we were talking about how we get attacked all the time. And, and one thing I had, I, I told her, and she told me the same thing. I said, the devil has nothing in me. He can come any way he wants to. He's going to leave here. And she said, you know that right? The devil got nothing in me. Can you say the devil got nothing in you? Who are you holding something against? Who you got unforgiveness against? The devil has anything into you? You still remember what your daddy did to you, what your mama did to you, what your great granddaddy did to you, what your brother did to you, what your sister did to you, what the, what the man raped you or the woman raped you? You still are holding that back. God, the devil got something in you because that was the works of the devil and it's controlling your life. If your father died from a, uh, a diabetes and your, uh, your grandfather died from diabetes and your brothers and sisters died from diabetes and you're going to go around and holler, I know I'm going to die from diabetes, that's the devil word. And what callous word is coming out of my eye? I know the diabetes is going to get me. Oh, Jesus. Saints, it's time to turn it all around. Because, again, I'm going to tell you the ultimate goal of the Holy Ghost for this congregation is that you rise above man. And that at the end time, Christians are supposed to have more than the evil people who serve the devil. And unless you go get the wealth that God been stacking up for you since he created the earth, you're going to be at the bottom. See, when God sent the Jews that was a representation of the church out to possess the land of the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Hittites, and all the heathens, he says, you go and you take the land. Don't leave any of them alive. Don't use, don't depend upon your own understanding. Depend upon the, the word of God. I told you that you could do it. And the first time they go, they're nine of them. We can't do it. Was it eight of them? It was eight of them. We can't do it. How many, what did you say? Twelve or ten spies. I want to make sure we get that right. How many spies did they send out? Ten. Yeah. Ten spies. They'll go up and look over the land. And see, because God told them to go ahead and possess the land of the Canaanites. Oh, they got giants over there. They got grapes that grow so big, you have to have two men carry them on their shoulders, the grapes. They got huge people over there. We can't do it. God told them you can do it. Take the land. Don't leave one of them alive. You must possess the land. And those eight who didn't believe God and talked against God, the earth opened up for them. They dropped straight into hell. But the two, Joshua and Caleb, they went over and they possessed the land. You ready, Pastor? Possess the land. From now on, you start possessing the land. It is not your call to give everything you have to the devil. It is your call to take everything the devil has. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give God some praise right now. Hallelujah. And God good. Amen. I was sitting there thinking and giving God praise. And call it for calling me out of darkness to the marvelous light. Be able to praise him and to glorify him and lift up his name and to know Jesus. 
How many of y'all know Jesus out there? Yeah, raise your hand. I know you do. Amen. But raise your hand anyway. Praise the Lord. Knowing Jesus. So important to know Jesus and to know what God will do for you. And having faith in him and knowing that if you believe in him, you will have everything. There's so many people in the body of Christ that, that are in the body of Christ, but yet they are not committed to God as they should be. And so sometimes we need to just turn it around. Because we look at, uh, it, when we look at Matthew 8, 8, and we can see that there was a man, centurion, that says, I'm not even worthy to, to even be under your roof, Jesus. And every day we should be telling ourselves that. We're not worthy of anything. We pat ourselves on the back and say, I'm worthy, for, I'm worthy to have this. I'm worthy to have that. I'm worthy to have this. And I need this. I'm supposed to have because I'm a Christian. And you are. But when in our hearts we can say, God, it's all because of you that I'm worthy. Then we know why we're worthy. Not worthy because we ourselves, or because we are or who we are, but who we are in Christ. That makes us realize that we're worthy because of him. He has to give us the opportunity to receive what he has. We can't just run in and grab it. And a lot of times we feel like, I'm worthy. You know, I read the Bible, I do this, I do that. And, and a lot of people that read the Bible and do all these things, they sometimes can be a whole lot worse than a centurion. Because their attitudes are worse than a satyrian. The way they operate is worse than a satyrian. I discovered that this week uh, about some things and hearing some things. That most of the people that we see out here are pretty much like the satyrian. And somebody said, well, why are you talking about it? Jesus is talking about it. He says he has more faith than some of y'all. So I can say the same thing. There's some satyrians out there that really believe God and know they're not worthy. But yet they know Jesus. I mean, they've seen what Jesus did. Know him in a certain way, maybe in a fleshly way, but they know him. But it says, but the satyrian said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof. But just say the word in my sermon over here. So he said, Jesus, if you said it's going to take place, what about your life? Jesus said something. Do you really believe it? All right. yeah. If you do, that's good. Because there's some people that, uh, you know, they're in the body of Christ. They know the word from top to bottom. When something happens, it's almost like, God, what are we going to do? You going to deliver me or what? And you have to stand on that word and know that God is going to deliver you from whatever it is that's going on. If he said it in his word, guess what? He will do it. He did it. He did it. He did it for this man because of his faith. You have faith. Faith will move mountains. You have faith to be healed. You'll be healed. You have faith for prosperity. You have prosperity. You have faith that God's going to keep you on the highway. He'll keep you on the highway. If you have faith... God will take care of you. You hear a lot of people say, well, you know, Johnny over there, Mary over there, they do it better than me, and they ain't even in the word of God. Well, you look at it and you see and you say, well, these people, everything's going right in their, in their life, and they're not serving God, and then here you are having chaos. You're not really having chaos. You're not really having trials. You're not really having tribulations. Because you could unfold their lives, you find is worse than yours. Really, it looks good on the outside. The inside, you're more blessed than they are. We don't think so because we see they're driving a fine car, they got a husband, they got a wife, they got kids going to college, everything working for them, and they, there's nothing going on out of the ordinary. But there is. You just don't see it. I had a, a, a come in contact with a person that I know when I come in contact with that person, the Holy Ghost revealed to me, you come in contact with that person because you got some work to do for God. I just finally realize it now, God, why do you put me here? You put me here because you need me to talk to somebody. Did you know God will do that? He'll take you somewhere and have you do something. When you get there, you realize you did it not for yourself, but you did it because you need to talk to that person about Jesus. 
That happened to me. I know what God told me to do. God, now I know why you told me to get in this relationship. Because I need to deal with this person. This person is hollering, God, God, God. But they're not doing anything God said do. It's easy to say God. What God are you talking about? I put the Lord, I put God in front of everything that I do. Are you really? And I was saying to myself, the other day, I said, I woke up early in the morning, the Lord says, write a, a text. I wrote a text. And I said, if you were on the highway, I think I told y'all that. Did I tell you that Wednesday night? If you were on the highway and something happened, had an accident, would you, would you go to heaven or hell? And I said, and some people get angry when you say this. If, you know, when you say something like this, a uh, sinner will get angry. But I said, why don't you write down on the right what you've done for God and write on the left what you did for yourself. See what you come up with. Would you go to heaven? I said, would you have eternity? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? And that really was something. That was a heavy thing to tell somebody. And I tell you what, I got an answer from that. I didn't judge anybody, I just wrote it. I do it all the time. I write it to many people. Not only my family, but other people too. I just write it. If I feel like the Holy Ghost tells me to write it, just go ahead and write it. Ask the question. Let them think about it. Let them think about it. Because here's a centurion that has more faith than some people that are in the church. Now, I didn't say that Jesus did. Don't get me out there. He just said that. And, and, and sometimes we say that when that happens, when we judge people, you know, Jesus said, this is an example, and I give examples too. This is an example of a person that know me in a way what he's seen, and not even want part of the body, but know that Jesus is real. And so in the church don't have enough faith to believe that Jesus will heal us, that Jesus will give us what we, what we should have from him that he's promised us. But he says, he says, to come under my roof, but just say, say the word and my servant will be healed. He says, for I also am a man on authority with soldiers under me. And just I say to one, go, and he goes, and to one, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who were following, truly I say to you, I have, found, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. That is something to say, isn't it? It is something to, for him to say. I haven't found anyone with that kind of faith. What kind of faith do you have today? You know, what kind of faith do you have when it comes to your walk with the Lord? Do you trust him in your life? Or are you running where the money is? Some people, if somebody said, well, you know what, I'll give you this. If you do this, you know, they're going to run into it, and they know good and well it's not of God, but it's because of money. You, as a body of Christ, cannot run and do things for money. You have to trust God for it. If God said he would take care of you, he'll take care of you whatever way he wants. But sometimes we will turn our back on God, what? For money. Because money is so important to us that we figure it belongs to us. And it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. I want you to know that everything you have belongs to what? God. Even you belong to God. And you need to think of it like that. You need to think of it as I own nothing. I'm not worthy of nothing. Everything belongs to God. Everything I have belongs to God. If you try to hold on to it, it'll be taken away from you. But when you hear the word of God, it is supposed to be firmly rooted in you. Is that not true? I'm going to move over to something right here. If I can read this on this paper here. Let's go to Luke 8, 11, and Pastor Ralph went through this, but I'm going to go another way. Now the parable is this. The, soul, the seed is the word of God. Everybody know that. Those beside the road are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and take away the word with their hearts so that they will, not, they will not believe and be saved. 
minute you receive the word of God, here come the devil. Oh, I wouldn't do that. Oh, I don't believe that. Oh, I got a problem with this. I just don't believe that. I'm not sure whether I believe that or not. We well, either believe it or you don't believe it. How can there be an in between? I want you to know you don't make your own decisions about what God told you to do. God never left it up to you to make any decision on anything. It's not what you think. It's what he says. He has rules in his Bible for you. And you have to abide by his rules and don't think with your head, well, I believe. Well, what, did you read it? Did you read it in the Bible or you just believe it? Show me a scripture. The devil comes to steal, immediately to steal the word of God. The minute you hear something, he gets in your head and he says, I don't believe that. But the satyrian believe. But when the seed is sown, the devil comes and take away the word from their hearts. So that they will not believe, they will not be saved. Because if you don't believe, you ain't saved. And 13 says, and those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root, they believe for a while. For a little while, one receive the word, the devil comes and take it. The some that believe for a while, and then after that, they fall away with temptation. I've seen that happen in church many times. Some people come and they say, well, you know, I don't believe that, and they leave. Then you got some to come for a while, and in the time of temptation falls away. What's tempting you today to make you fall away? Is it money? Is it a job offer? Is it something that you're doing for because it's for you or you're doing it for God? You ask yourself that. Because the time is coming when you have to make a decision, yes, whether you're going to go for God or go for temptation. Did y'all hear that? You bleed for a while and then you'll fall away. There were some people that, um, I think we talked about tithes and offerings last week. There were some, some churches here that didn't believe in no tithes and offerings. You put whatever you want to put in there. They made up their mind that they were going to do what they wanted to do, not what God said. And they're not here anymore. Because you don't do what God says do. He says, I will build my church in the gates of hell and not prevail against it. But they went there and they gave whatever they wanted to give and they didn't listen to God. They had their own rules. Whatever they wanted to do is what they did. They didn't go by the Bible. They just put what they wanted in. They had their own. You know, some of these people think that they're greater than God. Like they think they're greater than black folks. Or white folks, Hispanic folks. They just had their own thing. They had their wine parties in the church and at the house and do whatever they want to do and think God's grace going to cover it. That of God, you talk, that not When you went young and in the church. But see, the devil comes immediately to steal the word from the people of God. And then you got some that believe for a little while and in time they fall away. Because of things that happen. And you know, you know, if God, I want to tell you this. If God didn't say it, don't do it. And I was thinking about, we, we didn't get into tithes and offerings because we're getting a lot of stuff here. But in the tithes and offerings realm, God never told you to do what you wanted to do. He always gave instructions for everything. Told you how to do everything. Didn't leave nothing out. 
Did everything else in the Bible, he left instructions. He says, take care of your pastors. Give what all the your good stuff share with your pastors. But when you say that, what happens? You bleed for a little while, and when temptation comes, you fall away. Uh, when you talk about tithes and offerings, you bleed for a little while. No, the tithes and offerings goes in number one. Those beside the road are those who heard, have heard, and the devil comes and takes away the word from your heart so that you will not believe and be saved. That's the one right there for the tithes and offerings. The other one is... Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no firm root. They believe for a while in the time of temptation, they fall away. The seeds which, are, which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard. And they go on their way. They are choked with worries and riches. And pleasures of life and bring no fruit of maturity. But the, the seed, but the seed in the good soil, those are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold fast and bear fruit with perseverance. And that is the lady that we just got, Pastor Rack just got to talking about. Firmly rooted. But the seeds in the good soil. Let me say this to you. Somebody said, I heard a pastor say, I believe that I believe she's right about not giving marriage license. But I think she should keep the laws of the land. What you gonna do when the rapture comes? If you left here, what you gonna do when they tell you that you either take the 666 or your child die? Or 